members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-919-4459. Again, the meeting ID number is 160-919-4459. And then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. And with that, we are ready to take our first call. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello. We can hear you. Uh, which items would you like to speak on? And please state your name. Hi, my name is Kale Hong and I speak on item eight. All right, uh, one minute for item eight, please begin. Hi, good morning, committee. I'm a student at the University of Southern California. I would like to stress the importance of item eight. Uh, reducing single use plastic is an important step in reducing our impact on our physical and natural environment, helping to clean up the city and help reduce physical waste. However, I'd like to note that businesses who distribute single use plastics uh, cannot be expected to transition without some aid from local government as the production systems are already in place. So helping our small business transition to using less single-use plastics will encourage greater use of reusable or biodegradable items and relieve the cost of transition. Additional zero-waste events and encouraging reusable alternatives is great, but means little if not everyone has access to them. Thus, I would like to emphasize the need for accessibility and equity when the city is planning to reduce single-use plastics. This means providing services in different languages or ensuring all residents across LA will have access to ways to reduce their use of single-use plastic. I really hope that item eight is addressed properly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, my name is Allison Walaszewski and I'd like to speak on agenda item number eight and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each item. Please begin. Thank you. Hello, my name is Allison Walaszewski, and I'm the Policy and Outreach Manager with the Five Gyres Institute and the co-chair of the Reusable LA Coalition. On behalf of Reusable LA and the community stakeholders we represent, who this week sent in over 2,000 emails directly to the committee, we urge you to pass agenda item number eight, because it's crucial that we phase out single-use plastic pollution as it's a source of um, devastating uh, impact for our most vulnerable communities. Throughout the whole entire life cycle of plastics, human health is jeopardized. Extraction and refining for fossil fuels needed to make plastics contribute to air pollution, climate change, and disproportionately impact our most vulnerable environmental justice and frontline communities. Once in consumer hands, plastics leak harmful toxins into our food and bodies that are known to be endocrine disruptors, cause birth defects, and are even carcinogenic. At the end of life, plastic is rarely recycled and continues to pollute either at incineration facilities, in landfills, or the natural environment. We must listen to science and phase out single-use plastics altogether. So we strongly urge this committee to continue Los Angeles' leadership in reducing its plastic pollution. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Vicki Kirschenbaum. Thank you for this chance to speak on item eight. Okay, you have one minute, please begin. I urge the committee to vote yes to reduce single use plastics. The plastic industry is booming. Fossil fuel companies to fight the declining demand for coal and gas are building ethane cracker plants to make plastic. Plants that rival coal burning power plants in dangerous emissions. The plastics industry is on track to by 2030 emit 1.34 billion tons of greenhouse gases per year, equal to the emissions of 300 new 500 megawatt coal plants. Ethane cracker plants also release benzene, formaldehyde, nitrogen oxide, and other harmful pollutants. It is past time to vote throw away plastic out of our lives. Thanks. Caller? Please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, my name is Craig Cadwallader, and I would like to speak on item eight and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each. Please begin. 
Thank you. My name is Craig Cadwallader, and I'm the policy coordinator for Surfrider South Bay. And I strongly encourage uh, moving forward on the single-use plastics prohibitions for the city. I would like to point out that um, I'm concerned that CEQA analysis is really important on this. I know it's mentioned in the materials that you would need to do an addendum for the bag ban EIR, but I did want to point out the city of San Diego passed their polystyrene ordinance in 2019. It's still on hold for them. They, there was litigation filed and they're doing an EIR. That draft EIR was only published on December 10th, so it's been delayed three years. So I hope the city can find the best way to move forward on that. And then on um, the item about the dishwasher capability for the LA Mall, I would love to see the city providing some sort of grant funding to expand dishwashing infrastructures and uh, similar to item seven in the LA County uh, motion yesterday that uh, is providing grant funding for manufacture of, of alternative products. Um, a dishwashing hub capability uh, would be helping many, many businesses move forward with the uh, reusables for dine in. Then finally, I hope you will support the plastics initiative on the 2022 ballot. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi there. Uh, my name is Emily Parker. I'd like to speak on general public comment and agenda item eight. All right. You have one minute for each. Please begin. Thank you and good morning, Chair O'Farrell and committee members. My name is Emily Parker. I'm the Coastal and Marine Scientist with Heal the Bay, a local environmental nonprofit dedicated to water health. I'm also the co-chair of Reusable LA, a coalition of Los Angeles-based organizations fighting against plastic pollution and pushing for a thriving culture of reuse and refill. As an invested stakeholder that, that has been following the process of reducing harmful waste related to plastics at the LA City Council for many years, we're thrilled to see the committee making these much needed steps. And we strongly support the committee moving forward with the LA sanitation recommendations in the presented March 30th report. We'd like to particularly express strong strong support for the council moving forward with requesting the city attorney to draft ordinances for zero waste city facilities and events, banning expanded polystyrene products, and expanding our single-use carryout bag ordinance. These ordinances are an essential next step in reducing plastic pollution that's not only contaminating our waterways, but our communities as well. In addition to these recommendations from LA San, Reusable LA would like to again offer another recommendation for immediate action. Just two days ago, the LA County Board of Supervisors passed the first reading of an ordinance that will, among other things, require reuse for dine-in at food facilities. Switching to reusable options is widely considered the most effective method to reducing plastic pollution and was cited in the UCLA Luskin Center report as the best solution for Los Angeles. Requiring reusable, reusable foodware for on-site dining is one of the best tools that we have available to benefit our environment and our communities by both reducing pollution while also benefiting our businesses and providing cost savings. We recommend that the committee also consider a reuse for dine-in ordinance immediately instead of waiting. I'd like to close by thanking the dedicated members of this committee for pushing these necessary policies forward for the health of both Angelinos and our precious natural environment. Reusable LA is standing by to support these efforts and provide any assistance in getting them passed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers in the queue. All right. Thanks everyone for calling in today and taking the the time uh, out of your work day to give us your thoughts. Uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to continue. I'd like to move to continue item six to a future committee hearing. If there are no objections, uh, that will be the order. Council member Mitchell File. Aye. Council member Paul Koretz. Aye. Council member Gil Cedillo. Council member Kevin De Leon. Council member Kevin De Leon. Council member Paul Krikorian. Aye. And the item is approved, sir. All the items you mentioned is approved. Thank you, sir. Uh, that would bring us to item four and Mr. CLA. 
Well, Mr. Sutton Willis, if you could please read the item. Good morning, members. Item number four is a motion, Rodriguez, correct, relative to the instruction for the Bureau of Sanitation in coordination with the city, city administrative officer to report on a needs assessment on the current green waste infrastructure concentrated near multifamily dwelling units and on the feasibility of a pilot program utilizing underground mechanized waste and recyclable material collecting technology on the public right of way. Thank you, sir. And colleagues, I'd like to amend the second moving clause of this item to read as follows. I further therefore move that the council instruct the Bureau of Sanitation in coordination with the city attorney to report within 45 days on the feasibility of establishing a pilot program relative to the use of underground mechanized waste and recyclable material collection technology for the efficient management of organic waste and recyclable material collection on the public right of way. And do we have any questions uh, on this amendment, colleagues? Uh, seeing as none, uh, Mr. Park, if you could go on mute. <laughs> Seeing as there are uh, no questions or comments, I'd like to move this item uh, forward as amended. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Chairman, sure, Mr. Chair. Council, Council Member Michapayo. Aye. Council Member Polkaretz. Council Member Polkaretz. Council Member Gilcedillo. Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Council member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Let me go back to council member Paul Correct. Otherwise, we won't have a whole room. I mean, uh, a <laughs> majority. I De Leon I. De Leon I. De Leon I. Okay, we got the I. We got the I. All right. <laughs> Good. Okay, so, um, yeah, so council member Mitchell Farrell, council member Aye. Kevin De Leon, and council member Paul Krikorian is okay with it. So, it's approved as amended, sir. Great. Thank you so much. So that item moves forward. All right. Uh, now I'd like to move on to item one. Mr. Sutton Willis, if you could please read item one. Yes. Item number one is a communication from Council President Pro Tem relative to the appointment of Ms. Jocelyn Duarte to the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission. Thank you so much, colleagues. I'm so excited to have uh, my friend Jocelyn Duarte, who is a, a real powerhouse in the 13th district and uh, is uh, head of an, or, uh, an amazing organization uh, doing great work on all different kinds of advocacy and uh, injustice issues and climate justice being one of them. Uh, so we have Ms. Duarte with us. She is my nomination to the Climate Energy Mobilization Commit, uh, Commission. So I want to thank you, Jocelyn, for volunteering to serve, and I'll hand it over to you to give us your thoughts about serving on the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission, and perhaps cover some of your goals and objectives you'd like to pursue as a member of, of this commission. So I'll hand the floor over to you at this, at this time, Jocelyn. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman O'Farrell and community yeah. members. I want to say, uh, you know, a big thank you um, for this opportunity to serve my city and my community. My name is Jocelyn Duarte, and I was born and raised right here in Los Angeles. I'm a proud mother of two, a professor at East Los Angeles Community College and California State University, Northridge. I lead an educational fund that was founded over 27 years ago, the Salvadoran American Leadership and Educational Fund, known as SALEF, that advocates for immigrant communities. I am really looking forward to serving on, CMO, on the CMO Commission because the communities that I work with on the ground and I represent deserve to have their voices heard as the city focuses on eliminating pollutants, greenhouse gases, and other dangers to our communities. And it will be an opportunity for me to bring my background, my expertise in teaching and working with college students to the table. Students that today want the opportunity to be part of a movement and create efforts in their communities and the city and that CIMO Commission would and should tap into. 
Finally, I want to take a moment to thank you, Chairman O'Farrell, for allowing me to bring the voice of immigrant rights activism to this council's initiatives and saving rapidly our warming planet. Immigrants are Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a city of immigrants, and I look forward to helping the city of immigrants lead the state, country, and the world in fighting sustainability, inclusion, visibility, harm reduction, and a greener, smarter planet while fighting against global warming and dirty fossil fuels. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you so much, and colleagues. I've had the, the pleasure and honor of knowing Jocelyn for several years now. We've collaborated on so many, um, so many initiatives and actions that have uplifted folks who really are, have been voiceless historically. So I know Jocelyn will have zero questions for her, but uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for Ms. Duarte? I, I'm not seeing any. I, I, I think I think you presented well, <laughs> Jocelyn, and and of course uh, that's no surprise to me. Uh, so, colleagues, I'd like to move to approve this appointment. Second. Okay. Uh, please call the roll, Mr. Villanueva. Hello, Mr. Chair. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Hi. Council, Council Member Paul Corretz. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Item one is approved, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Duarte. You are uh, one of forward to the full council and uh, You'll be part of the CMO Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Um, I'd now like to go to item eight. Mr. Sutton Willis, if you could please read item eight. Yes, sir. Item number eight is a Bureau of Sanitation report on a reduction of single use plastics, including re reusable alternatives, zero waste events, facilities, and related matters. Thank you so much. Colleagues, the issue of single-use plastics is not new. The phase-out of single-use plastics has been underway for years now in Los Angeles, in many places in the county, and in, in California. In Los Angeles, through our plastic bag ban, our straws upon request, plastic utensils av available upon request only, we've done many, many things. Uh, I want to thank all of those involved all of my colleagues on the city council, all of you uh, are advocates, our public, our own Department of Sanitation, uh, Bureau of Sanitation for helping us make progress on this critical subject. And we know that we have a lot farther to go. I mean, even my plastic straws upon request ordinance that was put in place about three years ago, maybe longer, um, is not exactly turning out the way I wanted it to. I don't know about any of you, but I'll go to restaurants and I'll just drop a plastic straw on my table. And so people are getting the hint that plastics are terrible for the environment and that probably we need to take a stronger action locally in terms of regulating uh, single use plastics out into our waste stream. Now, in our last discussion, we moved for LA San to coordinate with necessary departments to report on the steps needed to effectively implement and transition to phase out of the purchase of single use plastics. We also instructed the Bureau of Sanitation to identify projects associated with comprehensive strategies to reduce plastic waste in Los Angeles and asked our own general services department, part of water and power, recreation and parks to on the deployment of drinking fountains, portable hydration stations, and the necessary funding to deploy them throughout the city facilities. Based on your instructions, our instructions, LA San transmitted a report, and that's what's before us today. So it covers many different issues and items. And so I think to, in order to um, articulate exactly what we're dealing with today, and to give context to this overall approach, I'd like uh, for our own uh, LA Sanitation Bureau to go over the report. And so 
who do we have from sanitation today to uh, go over their answer questions? Um, I, hi, council member. Thank you. Oh. It's uh, director and general manager, Barbara Romero. And um, I, I'm going to just just uh, do a quick intro and excuse the, my, the realities of working from home, if you hear the gardener in the background. Um, but I just want to make sure, uh, before I turn it over to Alex, to say that you did ask us to report back on what we could do. And there are, you know, and everything we're proposing here is stuff we can do at city facilities within the city family first. But we're also looking at how we can start the sequel process at the same, you know, in, in that recommendation. But um, but we're also very in that to make it clear, the secret process that we're talking about is not um, is not the extensive process that you typically would have to do um, in other um, in other scenarios because this is something that I think we are we do I think it's and and um, uh, Paul can correct me Kobian is I think it, uh, we can do it with a categorical exemption which I think the important part for everyone here to know is that it's not as much as much time if we do have to go that route with that with that approach. Terrific, and you know, Ms. Romero, thank you so much for joining us. And I appreciate that. And I really wanna give voice to the callers today because what I heard through all of the, the participants this morning is sense of urgency. And I believe this panel, I believe the department uh, or the bureau, and I believe the city, we are in lockstep with a sense of urgency. Um, over the years we've led this, we know what's working and what isn't. So. I think the sense of urgency is what's going to, to really lead our way here. Uh, so I, I, I thank all of the callers for giving illustrations of delays in other cities based on CEQA, et cetera. Yeah. We're, we're going to waste no time in the city of LA uh, to move forward on these issues. So, so thank you. And I'll turn it back over yeah. to you, Barbara. Yes, thank you. And I think that is correct. If you, um, we obviously had, get, had got that advice, but if we need to go faster, you know, that is a policy direction that we could proceed with that. So I'm happy to uh, turn it over to Alex now to to uh, highlight some of the report backs that um, some of the progress on on your instructions. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, Honorable Chairman Ofero, Honorable Council Member Koretz, Krakorian, and De Leon. My name is Alex Halu, and I'm the Assistant General Manager for LA Sanitation and Environment. On December 2nd, 2021, we, pre we presented a comprehensive plastic report whose objective was to eliminate single use plastics. We followed your prior instructions to us to be both aggressive and bold. On February 17, 2022, the city council adopted the report and the energy climate change, environmental justice and river committee instructions. Today, we are here to report back on the instructions given to Ali San by your committee. We will go over each instruction and our recommendations to you to achieve the vision for a zero waste city. We have few changes in our presentation than in our report. And that is due to the fact that events have transpired since we have uploaded the report. I wanna turn it over to Jennifer to go item by item and our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to the um, committee. Um, could you advance to slide three, please? Yes, thank you. So this was one of the specific instructions was for sanitation and coordinate with GSD, RAP, city attorney, and other relevant departments. Um, we have taken those steps. We have met with all of those departments. Um, and I do want to Jennifer, Jennifer, I'm yes. going to for just a quick second. Could everyone go on mute, please, except for Ms. Pinkerton? If everyone could double check and go on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that, Ms. Pinkerton. No, nope, no problem at all, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have met with the departments that are listed in this instruction. We've had some very fruitful discussions. I do want to say, though, that at this point, um, we're sort of scratching the surface. We will need to come back to this committee with a very long laundry list of um, instructions and information that we need to attain, and we would like you to issue those as instructions to other departments. Um, I also want to comment that 
our work on the plastics reduction, pollution reduction, and zero waste events has become highly intertwined with the zero waste departmental plans that are underway. So it's a little difficult to separate the two at this point, which I think is to our advantage. Um, someone in the mayor's office is now basically walking these city departments through the process of completing and improving their zero waste plans. But there are still some high level actions that I think we will need to take um, things such as an EPP ordinance, things on that order. Um, and as you know, we did draft a zero waste events policy. The focus of that is on single use plastics, expanded polystyrene, as you've heard a lot of callers mention, reusable, recyclable, or compostable containers. Um, <laughs> writing for the rescue of surplus edible food. And it also includes a number of recommendations on reducing the generation of surplus food, which is a very important upstream um, policy measure that I think we should adopt. And I would like to comment the, that the Mayor's Youth Council on Climate Action contributed some very valuable suggestions in this arena. Um, next slide. This is a list of departmental zero waste plans that we have received. So you can see we've received quite a few that are final or in draft form in the left column. In the right column, those are departments that are currently working with Mr. Ryan Jackson in the mayor's office to complete their reports. Uh, next slide, please. There are three from which we have received no information. And then there are a few departments that because they do not have Chief sustainability officers, they were not directed by the mayor's office to complete zero waste plans. But we will continue to work with the mayor's office should the council want these other departments to complete plans and to ensure that the plans are as rigorous as they can possibly be. And just to recap quickly, we gave every department a zero waste checklist for measures that we thought they should all adopt. These are baseline, very basic measures in a number of areas, paper, office products, landscaping practices, lunchroom practices, things of that sort. Then we also directed each department to look at wastes that are unique to them, which would be LADWP, the plastic reservoir shade balls, for example, because these are things that typically are very difficult to process at the end of their lives. They don't have recycling markets. Um, fire hoses from the fire department, another, another example. Um, this slide, one thing that surprised me very much when we were developing the plastics report is the fact that we don't have what I would call a city manual. It was very difficult to find out, well, who's in charge of landscaping throughout the city? I assumed it was GSD, but it's not. So one of my goals with the development of the zero waste plans and our pollution, plastic pollution policies is to get a handle on who is in charge, which departments are in charge of which functions, because there is no one place you can go to get this information currently. It's very siloed at this time. Um, but we need a lot of baseline information. For example, we need copies of event scheduling forms, event reservation forms. We do not have a database of city events, which was surprising to me, because I'm sure there are a lot of repeat events. We need all this baseline information so that we can make sure that the zero waste and the plastic pollution control policies infiltrate all of our operations, all of our guidelines, and all of our forms. Um, we will need a list from GSD supply services of all contracts that include plastic items so we can investigate these and determine if there are vi viable non-plastic alternatives to them. As you know, we recommend banning the sale of water and plastic bottles um, as LAX did. So where one of our tangible steps is identifying all vending machines that are on city property. And surprisingly, again, there is no one city or even multiple city contracts for these. Vending machines are brought into city facilities under informal agreements through different employee associations. Um, we need a database of city facilities. So because one of the things, if you wanna look at reducing waste in lunch rooms and you wanna encourage the use of reusable foodware, are there dishwashers? Are there garbage disposals? Is there space for collection bins for blue bin recyclables as well as food waste? Because part of our efforts, not just plastic, but reducing organics waste to comply with SB 1383. Um, LEDWP at one time had binders of all their facilities that had information of this sort. It was very useful to implement a recycling program over there. And I would like to see the city be able to develop the equivalent for our zero waste outreach and zero waste program. Uh, next slide, please. 
We were also instructed, as you'll recall, to in, um, begin stakeholder process engagements on plastic pollution, you know, uh, expanded polystyrene foodware. So we have met with several environmental organizations and we have met with industry groups and several of the enviros called in today. I'm sure you're well familiar with them. We have sketched out a preliminary plan for conducting stakeholder outreach, which includes many local chambers of commerce. Um, one thing that, again, was surprising in trying to identify minority-owned businesses, that information is not readily available. In the Office of Finance, that's a um, optional self-reported category, and only 10 businesses chose to report that. So that's one thing we may want to consider is a change in the finance procedure so we can obtain information like that if you feel it's critical. Um, we're coordinating with LA County, talking with them about outreach. Um, we have obtained the survey that they sent out to restaurants in the unincorporated county. We will reach, we will work with restaurant associations such as the Latino Restaurant Association and others because there are quite a few of those out there and we feel those are the best mechanism for, for reaching restaurants. We have been told repeatedly that restaurant owners and managers are so very busy that getting them to a table, getting them to a meeting is difficult, but we're confident with that by partnering with groups like Reusable LA, Break Free From Plastic, that they will be able to assist us in making these recommendations. So we do have that initial plan and we plan to be um, begin holding these stakeholder meetings very shortly. Just one other quick comment, we are going to be offering zero waste um, training just to make sure that we know actions that the city departments are taking, make sure they're on track with their development of their plans so we can give you the updates that you have requested. So I'd like to turn this over to Paul Cobian to discuss the CEQA aspects. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council members. My name is Paul Cobian. I'm an environmental supervisor too, uh, providing CEQA supporting guidance to Alley Sanitation. Um, we have conducted a preliminary assessment of the various plastic reduction measures and goals that were approved by City Council on February 17th, 2022. Uh, the, the following three slides uh, present potential CEQA pathways uh, and a tentative schedule, including outreach activities on how we can achieve those measures and goals. Uh, when we begin the actual environmental analysis and review the various environmental considerations, we will have the responsibility to provide substantial and supporting evidence to support each CEQA determination, uh, as well as to ensure that it is implemented within the parameters of existing law. Um, if we do determine that we do not have substantial evidence to support a CEQA determination, we will need to consider completing a higher level of environmental analysis uh, that we are proposing today. Um, in the report, um, we discuss a uh, pathway forward for achieving zero waste facilities and events. Uh, in our CEQA review for this policy, we would need to evaluate the evidence and whether there would be any environmental impacts from enacting these regulations, and particularly whether the regulated users, in this case city departments, facilities, events, would need to shift to using uh, an alternative product that might impact the environment and whether such changes could have a significant impact on the environment. For the EPS ban, um, LASAN is proposing a phased approach. Um, I think our general manager, Barbara Romero, mentioned this. Um, and so this is really kind of starting with the ban uh, of EPS kind of at city sponsored events, facilities, and then maybe expanding that to the, the implementation uh, citywide. The public outreach effort would focus on education and support uh, to businesses uh, and a campaign to raise awareness of the benefits of this program uh, on public health and the environment. Uh, lastly, LA San is recommending the expansion of the single use carryout bag ordinance to certain stores that were excluded in the original single use carryout uh, bag ordinance. From a CEQA perspective, the 2013 environmental impact report for single use carryout bags would be the foundation for preparing an addendum to expand the uh, environmental impact report analysis to additional establishments. Um, the following slide uh, touches on additional plastic reduction measures and goals as outlined in LA Sands uh, Comprehensive Plastic Report to Council Committee on December 2nd, 2021. Uh, those measures include reusable foodware for dine-in services, uh, fees on disposables, leashed beverage lids, and banning plastic bottles. Um, the next slide, and also found in the report, presents a, a tentative timeline of achieving uh, really the, the various plastic reduction measures and goals. Um, the tentative timeline identifies fulfilling CEQA requirements, um, providing accessible and equitable uh, public outreach, engagement, education, support in uh, the communities and the businesses, as well as enforcement. 
Um, it is important to note that these proposed activities and tasks are dependent upon LA San uh, receiving the appropriate staffing and resources as uh, we had presented uh, to this council committee back in December um, of 2021. Um, we do believe that this tentative timeline aligns with city council's instructions to LA San to be aggressive and bold in developing uh, a long-term plastic reduction strategy. Um, so next we have Dr. Rowena Romano. She is the division manager for Ali Sands uh, Solid Resources Citywide Recycling Division. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, council members. Um, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. I can skip that part of my presentation. Um, but continuing on the additional instructions that we did receive from council, as council member Barrow mentioned, the drinking fountains and hydration um, stations, we did meet with GSD, DWP, and RAP. Um, uh, Rec and Park, sorry, regarding the importance of the drinking fountains and hydration stations to reduce um, single use plastic usage, particularly bottled water here on city facilities. Um, we also um, got the instruction for the CLA to draft resolutions in support of the policy recommendations that we identified in our December um, report, which included things such as um, mandating post consumer content on plastic bottles, disposal ban of uh, textiles ban on non-recyclable packaging, um, banning the sale of bioplastics, um, items regarding PFAS, filtration systems for washing machines, um, and mandated labeling and disclosure of material types. So we will continue to work with the CLA um, as he drafts those resolutions. However, I, we did want to point out and thank you to this committee um, for the resolution in support of the California Recycling and Plastic Redu um, Pollution Reduction Act that was adopted by City Council um, this past March. And also we saw the resolution in support of recommendations of the California Statewide um, Commission on Recycling and Curbside Recycling. So those, um, and that second item we believe is um, still in, in committee. Um, lastly, we were instructed to also submit in an inclusion in the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 22-23 for the staff positions needed to effectuate these um, policy goals, and we did submit that package um, to the mayor for the, for the next fiscal year. And now I'll go through the recommendations that we have in our report for council action. So we are asking that um, the council instruct LA Sand to develop an online zero waste training course that we will be able to um, provide to all city members and instruct the personnel department to implement the annual training starting next January, 2023. We believe that this will help um, engage our city employees and continue the zero waste policies as Jennifer mentioned that the mayor is working on with all the city departments. Secondly, to instruct all city departments to purchase only recycled content paper products and printing and writing paper that are at least 30% um, by fiber weight, post-consumer fiber to meet the city's zero waste policies, as well as SB 1383 regulations. And this would include also requiring the record keeping to indicate um, that, they are, that the city is meeting the procurement requirements. So the um, procurement of these would need to in, you know, ensure that the materials are recyclable and also eligible for an unqualified label, meaning that the material is recyclable and can be recycled where the uh, material is being sold or purchased at. Alisan is also recommending an instruction that upon approval of the funding um, for 22-23 budget year, to, that we begin this environmental review and analysis in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, as Paul has mentioned. Um, in, in regard to the CEQA guidelines and statutes regard, regarding the banning of the EPS products citywide, implementing a zero waste city facilities and events on city property policy and expanding the single use carry out bag ordinance. Number four is to request the city attorney in coordination with LA San and the other departments to then draft the ordinances. Um, this one in particular for the zero waste city facilities and events on city property, as well as the necessary contract provisions that need to be incorporated in the future tenant lease agreements. Um, carrying on, we also would like to request the city attorney in coordination with LA San to draft the ordinance that bans the expand, expanded polystyrene products on a citywide basis in the phased approach in which Paul mentioned, and also request the city attorney in coordination with LA San to expand the single use carry out bag ordinance within the parameters of existing laws, as we know there to stores that provide a single use carry out bag to customers at the point of sale. Um, 
next we would like um, the instruction for LSN to report back on the California Plastic Waste Reduction Regulations Initiative, in which the council and mayor has already passed a resolution to support. Um, this, in, this initiative um, will be on the November 8, 2022 ballot and would help eliminate single-use plastic. So we hope in our next report to be able to report on the outcome of this ballot measure. And lastly, the recommendation, as Jennifer has pointed out, we will need to start gathering information from all the other city departments. This one in particular for GSD um, by September 30, 2022 to, to submit to LSAD to help us um, gather this data baseline information, a report on the timeline and cost to create or repurpose room or space for the installation of commercial dishwashers in the LA mall, and for which this could be used for the food beverage provider, um, provider tenants there so that they may more easily comply with the zero waste mandates that we are um, putting forward and prohibit the disposal um, disposable foodware. The report shall also identify other city facilities that house food beverage provider and tenants and whether these facilities have space, such as not limited to storage and operation rooms that could be utilized for these dishwashers. So those are the recommendations that we're asking for council to take on this report. Um, and of course, we um, will be reporting back on you know, the instructions um, here on, on our next um, report back. So thank you, everyone. And that's the end. Thank you so much for everyone who reported. Uh, it, it's, it's complex um, and it involves, of course, the citywide ban of plastics and it, uh, and, and it also uh, covers uh, really putting our own house in order in the city with our facilities. So um, this report uh, in, includes a number of policy recommendations to achieve our sustainability objectives. Has the department performed a fiscal analysis of the implementation of these policies? I mean, it states that the submission uh, of a supplemental budget, but the costs and revenue sources aren't necessarily provided. So do you have a sense of, of what those might include? Can you elaborate on, on some of that? On, thank you for the question, Council Member Ofero. We, there are some costs will be associated with implementing these programs, but we believe the environmental benefits out, outweigh what the cost is, go, is going to be. For example, our idea of installing a dishwasher at City Hall, that would help reduce the amount of waste generating at City Hall. That is, we did a analysis of the black bin, blue bin, and the green bin at City Hall through waste characterization, both at City Hall, East, and City Hall. And we believe if we implement a, a reusable system, dishwashers, for example, as well as other stuff that we implemented in our previous report, there will be a reduction in the amount of trash that's going to the landfill. There will be a reduction of amount of organics. And so we'll be able to capture the environmental benefits. We do have a small initial cost, for example, um, retrofitting the dishwasher area uh, down the city hall, but also could create jobs because we can have um, a nonprofit organization who could basically take the, dish, uh, the plates, clean them, and use them repeatedly during the events will be held at city hall. So our ideas, uh, have initial cost, but we believe the environmental benefits as well as the cost in the long term more than pay for itself. Thank you. Uh, and in association with the recycled paper content, has the Bureau initiated research to understand the availability of procurement of, of these paper products? Oh, yes. And Jennifer could elaborate more on that. We have done a lot of study and we looked at what's really coming from and i'll have jennifer start and whatever she misses i'll try to add jennifer thank you alex, alex. um yes we've done research into quite a few food containers um paper-based food containers are out there they're readily available some of these things do have a price premium compared to polystyrene or foam food containers but studies from the rethink reusables initiative has shown that restaurants that switch to compostable recyclable containers typically achieve a payback 
in less than a year, despite the increase in the costs. Um, there are one thing that concerned me particularly is finding out how prevalent PFAS are in fiber based food containers and food wraps. And luckily, there is California legislation that was adopted pertaining to that AB 1200 from Assembly Member Ting, um, because that has implications for our composting operations should we begin composting paper based food containers. But there are containers out there that are available with no PFAS. So there are a lot of environmentally preferable options out there that we're aware of. Um, we see recyclable compostable containers as possibly interim for some restaurants with the idea of pushing everyone to reusables, but um, there are a lot of options out there. There are bamboo ware, there are, there's leaf ware out there, and we've actually given samples to different entities to test the compostability of those items also. Alex, did I leave anything out? I mean, we also did a study about the paper that the city uses for the printing and what could be used as an alternative. And that's why we're recommending the council approves the 30%. This way, departments will have to be also leading by example. Right. And it's in line with what you have told us repeatedly, and it's also in line with SB 1383. Okay. Yeah, so, so in other words, uh, to Jennifer's point, some of these so-called paper products still contain polystyrene, so we have to we have to ensure that um, paper products are not compromised uh, in such a way that fools the consumer. Right. Yeah. right. Great. Uh, so recommendations five and six are requests for ordinances for banning polystyrene citywide and for single use bags. Uh, in our last committee hearing, we asked for CEQA analysis to be completed, including gathering feedback from a wide array of small and minority-owned business stakeholders that may be impacted. Where where are we with that? I will let Paul talk about Paul Kobe talk about the 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 CEQA and how we plan to implement it. Because as Craig mentioned, uh, one of the speakers, the city of San Diego rushed in with no CEQA analysis. Unfortunately, they stuck in court. We, our plan phases in with an analysis upfront that we need to do. And Paul could elaborate on this. So we do not get end up stuck in courts and let, you know, and legal issues. Paul? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's correct, Alex. So, you, you know, what, once a lead agency has determined that uh, a discretionary action meets the definition of a project, uh, the, the lead agency needs to determine the level of environmental review that is required. Um, uh, that, that determination of what kind of environmental review uh, document is based upon uh, experience within the community, knowledge of past decisions, uh, changes in law, or, and uh, court, court decisions as well. Um, so as of right now, um, we, we have assessed based upon the initial understanding of, of what the discretionary action is. In this case, it was, it's the definition of, of the goal, whether that's EPS or that's expansion of um, the, the, the plastic bag ordinance. Um, so based upon that, we, we have um, had a, uh, in, uh, a consultant, uh, CEQA expert, to be providing us also guidance on this. Um, so it's not only internally, we've been getting uh, kind of, uh, kind of the, a third party uh, input on this as well. Um, so we, we feel re re relatively comfortable with what we are proposing. Um, one of the things, as we mentioned in December, I mentioned today as well, um, uh, funding is an issue. And, and so it's, it's been kind of one of the reasons why uh, we haven't been able to contract, for instance, with a uh, outside consultant for us to begin the work, um, but we, we, we do have a plan in place um, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to, to getting that work done. Thank you. Uh, do, we, do we need a sequence analysis for a complete phase out of single use plastics of any kind across the city of Los Angeles? Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it depends, right? I, once again, in terms of how, how we want to define um, complete phase out, right? I, I think right now what we've been doing based upon um, our initial analysis of, of the various products, the various uh, food accessories, um, you know, even when we talk about EPS, the focus, for instance, can be strictly uh, foodware accessories. But if we begin to talk about uh, packaging material, we begin to talk about uh, the buoys that are in the ports and things, things like that, things that are encased in, in polystyrene. Well, now we just brought in the definition of EPS ban, um, and and that's that for me uh, as 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 the CEQA 
uh, person, that, that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated because we have to evaluate what are those impacts. Um, and then once again, as we mentioned, what is we, we would need to determine the level of environmental review based upon the definition of, of what we are trying to achieve um, with, with that, as, as CEQA defines as a project. Um, so uh, th the short answer is it, it simply depends on how we define the, the, the totality of the project. We also have a state uh, regulation that preempt us on some plastics, the plastic bags. And so we, Paul has been working with the city attorney to find the narrow path that was left out from the state regulations. And that's the plastic that we're talking about. Okay. And, you know, back to CEQA again, just hammering in on this. Um, what is the level of analysis in order to move forward with an ordinance with zero waste specific to city facilities and events on city property. You kind of, you, you more or less answer that Paul with the two questions ago about the phasing in of the ban as analysis with analysis up upfront. Uh, and, and Barbara kind of mentioned maybe a mitigated negative deck brought into the conversation. So, so, so what about us moving forward with, with the uh, banning just with city facilities? We think we think the appropriate level of, of environmental review, um, based upon the information we have, based upon the the parameters in which we've talked with other city departments, we've we've talked with um, just what the intended goal is. We believe that a categorical exemption um, would be sufficient um, for us to to achieve uh, a zero waste uh, for facilities and events. Uh, Paul, can you elaborate in terms of uh, what you uh, propose would be the uh, the amount of time that it would take for a categorical exemption? Yeah, and, and so the, the thank you, Barbara. I, I think you know similar to um, uh, what we did for the straws on request as well as the utensils on request. Um, those were achieved using a categorical exemption. Um, I, I think what what was different about that period versus now is that. Um, there was development of the ordinance, the definition was very clear. And so when my team was brought in, um, it was very easy for us to identify what the project was, what the definition of the ordinance, and for us to evaluate it as such. Um, to, to answer your question, Barbara, uh, it, it would. It, I, I think once we get approval, right, and, and we can proceed forward, we, we are looking probably about uh, three to four months for us to, to, to enact that. Thank you. And Barbara, I misquoted you. You said categorical exemption, not yeah. mitigated negative tech. I've got my environmental uh, signals crossed there. So um, was was CEQA required uh, for the airport as it relates to plastic? This is a great question. I think the city attorney should answer that one. I don't, uh, because we had that discussion with the city attorney and and I think really did more uh, online to answer that one. Hi, I'm not aware that anyone from my office that was part of those conversations is on at the moment. Um, I'm certainly not aware personally of what was um, advised with respect to the um, what happened to the airport, but I can find out um, who's involved and get back to you on that. Actually, I can What's chime that? in that I oh, talked to the airport and they said they did absolutely nothing. They just adopted the policy. Yeah. All right. Well, there's a sense of urgency and just like taking the plunge right there. Um, thank you. All right. So we had an instruction last time for DWP and Recreation and Parks to report on the deployment of drinking fountains, portable hydration stations, and the funding needed to deploy them throughout all city facilities. Do we have a sense of where we are with that or what progress we've made in that direction? Things. We uh, met with DWP and Serge Haddad is here. I think he can talk about it. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, uh, council members. I'm also here with Kawana Key from my staff. Kawana is uh, leading the charge with our hydration station initiative program. So back in 2019, we did have some council motions and the mayor's Green New Deal for us to uh, support all the city agencies um, to uh, install hydration stations. Uh, the goal has been 200 hydration stations. Um, by the end of this year in 2022. And um, I'm happy to report that we're making a lot of progress on that front. Um, although we as DWP are not responsible for all 200, um, we've have supported, I think to date, and Kawana, correct me if I'm wrong, over about over 100 of them 
um, by reimbursing up to $10,000 for outdoor hydration stations and up to $5,000 for indoor hydration stations. Um, we have a lot of, more on the um, queue that have to still be installed, um, but I know that our partners at Reckon Park, GSD, the zoo, library, and so on are installing hydration stations as we speak um, to, to go towards that goal. Um, and for us, a hydration station, just for everybody's uh, knowledge, includes a bottle filler. It's not just the bubbler that comes out of the spout. Thank you. So uh, thanks for, for that verbal report. Could we get a written report back on, on this subject? Absolutely. Terrific. And can we have our city attorney go over uh, why an ordinance is preferred over an administrative process? In, uh, administrative process for, I'm sorry, I'm chiming in. I think I'm the only one of the city attorneys on here. Administrative process for um, adopting the, the single use plastic plan or whether an ordinance is necessary for um, creating some sort of uh, citywide policy to create. Yeah, city, just plan. city facilities specifically. Got it. Okay, got it. Just for city facilities. Um, I yes. don't know why that process was particularly chosen, but um, I will follow up and see if there was a specific advice from offices as, as to why they chose that route. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, do we need an ordinance for all departments to effectuate this? And, and that, that includes city facilities uh, and city events. I'll take a look at that for you. Terrific, thank you. Uh, now, we know that the county took action just a couple of days ago uh, for unincorporated areas as it relates to zero waste. Um, can we also take a look at how our requirements might be aligned with the county action? I'm sure it's, there are nuances, but, but they did take bold action just a couple of days ago. Uh, so, so we should just compare and contrast what, what that outcome and our outcome might be. I think one of the biggest differences, uh, Mr. Chair, is that the mandate for reusable foodware for dine-in meals pertains only to full service restaurants where the orders are taken from the customer at the table, whereas ours would apply to all dine-in meals regardless of the type of uh, service. So it would include casual or fast food restaurants as well. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, I forgot what the percentage of fast food restaurants are in Los Angeles, but it's high. So we would not want to leave out that entire sector uh, that can continue contributing to our plastic waste stream. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, so I'm sure Mr. Krikorian, uh, other colleagues might have questions or thoughts, frustrations. <laughs> Let, let's hear them. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're <laughs> certainly right on all scores. Uh, and. Uh, but you did cover a lot of the ground that, that I wanted to cover. So uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, first of all, I just want to, you know, congratulate LA Sand for this work. Um, this has been a long road. We're still on the road, um, but just getting to this point of this kind of a comprehensive analysis and report, um, just exactly the kind of policy work that um, I uh, so respect because this is not just setting goals. This is not, you know, stating some uh, objective. It, it's really developing a thorough plan thoughtfully and, uh, and thoroughly. And so I really want to just give kudos to, to all of you. It's, uh, it's very good work. Um, at the same time, um, I, I, it, it should be said uh, that we shouldn't be the ones doing this work. Um, our uh, colleagues in the state legislature should be doing this work for a statewide approach. Um, it's, it's, as usual, Los Angeles is leading on these environmental initiatives, and I hope the state will follow us. Um, but, but really, the, the way to make this most effective is with statewide policy. And so the Recycling and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act initiative hopefully will be a step in that direction. I think we need to at least 
uh, do that. So in the meantime, we're playing the cards that were dealt. And um, so I, I definitely thank LA Sand for all this uh, work. Um, I, you know, on the subject of urgency, which has been mentioned a number of times by the by the chairman, by um, LA Sand, by the callers. Um, it, I, one of my frustrations is that we often say that we have to act urgently, and it just doesn't feel like our progress is very urgent. And I, I just wanted to identify a, a couple of things. Um, you know, we, we talked just a moment ago about the hydration stations. Um, glad there's some progress being made there. Um, but by my motion, Los Angeles became the first blue city in America two and a half years ago. Um, and, and we made the commitments about, you know, installing hydration stations and so on two and a half years ago. And um, if, if it takes that long to meet a goal like this, then, you know, the council needs to understand why is it taking that long to get it done? Are there needs that need to be met in terms of resources, for example, so that the council can facilitate with the support of the mayor and, and mayor's office, the, this, whatever is necessary to get our council mandates accomplished. Because um, I'm just, I'm extremely frustrated that we set policy and then too often that policy just doesn't advance in the way that we have instructed that it advance. And, you know, when council or the, or, or the mayor by executive order um, set policy, I, I just expect that policy to be completed. Um, and another example of this is the departmental reports. Now, again, the, the mayor did required by executive order that these departments come back with their zero waste reports. Um, we further uh, instructed that they do so. And yet we still have departments who haven't even begun that work. Um, and many departments who have not completed that work. And that's not acceptable. And it, it's just not acceptable. And general managers who are hearing this need to understand that when we instruct something be done, it needs to be done. And if you can't do it in the thorough, comprehensive way that you feel it should get done, do it in a partial way and report back. We shouldn't be waiting years to get reports back that we've instructed be completed, period. Uh, so I'm, I'm just very frustrated about this. And LA Sand has you know, done a great citywide look, but how much better would this work have been if we had had the input from all of the departments by now, which we should have had, um, to be able to tie it into the comprehensive report? Uh, and then I just mentioned my, my last frustration, which is a constant refrain for me, and that is you know, the, what I think is the overly conservative uh, application of CEQA. Uh, and I especially get frustrated when the model environmental protection law of the entire United States of America, uh, CEQA, which has been our, you know, hallmark uh, environmental protection statute for all these years, is used to delay environmental protection. Um, and, and that just, it makes my head explode, whether it's in LA 100 and our inability to get transmission built or you know, any of these other areas, this is very frustrating to me. And I don't understand, and I'm, I'm glad the city attorney at your request, Mr. Chairman, is coming back with further analysis of this. I don't understand how a city's internal uh, uh, policies about our own events and our own offices could ever be considered a project. I, to me, I just don't understand that. And somebody's going to have to convince me that that, that is. Um, and I also don't have a very good understanding right now of 
why an ordinance is required on a lot of these areas for the city's own internal process and events. Uh, it seems to me that we can just make that decision that that's going to be city policy and ordinance isn't necessary and just do it. Um, so I'd really like some thoughtful work to be applied to what actually does require an ordinance, what does not, what can we implement immediately um, without an ordinance, and then to the extent that ordinances are required, which really require CEQA analysis as a project, and um, to the extent that they are, whether they're categorically exempt. So that, you know, that should, we should be very aggressive in trying to, to uh, speed this up through the CEQA process and avoid application of CEQA for these environmentally beneficial steps that, I, you know, just no one would have intended to have been considered a, a project when the legislature passed uh, CEQA. So um, that, that would be my request. Um, so uh, I, just more specifically, in the, in the November 21 report, um, LA SAN did identify accelerated CEQA uh, pathways to evaluate the EPS ban and um, also to you know, implement a number of the strategies uh, for uh, the um, uh, plastics reduction and so forth. Um, so I, I just, I, I'd like to understand, I mean, we did instruct at that time uh, that the department begin that work pursuant to that report. So where are we with that? Where are we with um, that accelerated pathway? And if there are additional resources that are needed, I, you know, what are they? And can we identify those and get those going? So I mean, we're, we're six months after this report now. And um, you know, again, on the subject of urgency, we got to move. So where are we with implementations of those accelerated pathways? And um, if we are not where we should be, what do you need in order for us to get there? Paul, what, can you share the, the I mean, I wanna start, the frustration you mentioned, Councilman Kirkonian, is the same thing we're facing. You know, I, know. I mean, we're the Department of Environment. We look at other cities. We compare ourselves to the other cities. And we say, well, why are they able to do it in the city of San Francisco? Why are they able to do it in this city, neighboring city, and we're not here? So the frustration you mentioned is really the one that we're feeling every single day. And it's becoming like, like a broken record. Mm -hmm. I hate yes, it, it is. It is. And, and I mean, uh, we're all environmental by nature. We... I mean, I'm an environmental engineer on top of it, but it just, it's frustrates me that you're right. The CEQA document is being used against us to expand a lot of these policies we want to see implemented. So to make long story short, we do, when we came with, in November, we had some funding. Unfortunately, because of the fiscal situation we're in sanitation, we did not have the money to, implement, to begin the CEQA right in December second after the report was done. So if we can get some help on the funding, you know, and we put again the funding and the positions in the next year budget. And our, my understanding, it will be in the mayor's um, budget allocated to us. If not, we hope it, it makes it final, but we do need the money. If we can get the money, we can begin the work. You know, we have leveraged every single penny we had we, we even got some pro bono work from different people because we want to get this going. But really coming down to the resources that we identified that we need. Okay, well, well you're talking to the right guy. So um, I, I guess we'll have deeper conversations about that. But um, you know that, that's the sort of conversation I think that we need to have as soon as possible so that we can you know, not come back six months or a year or two and a half years later and say, well, you know, thanks, you know, thanks for your instructions council, but we weren't able to, to do that because of X, Y, or Z. It's it just, we can't keep uh, 
this pattern going. I mean, when the, when the council and the mayor provide policy, that policy needs to be implemented. And if, if to your point, you have this frustration of not being able to do that because of very legitimate you know, reasons of resources or legal constraints or whatever, we just constantly need to know that so we, we can help you to meet uh, the expectations that the policymakers have. And I think that's what I would say to all general managers. Um, with regard to, to CEQA, Alex, that, um, and we talked, the chairman mentioned the airport. Um, you will recall that we implemented uh, that uh, plastic bottle, uh, water bottle ban back then. LAX services, you know, nearly 100 million, you know, people a year. And um, there was no CEQA analysis necessary for that. So I, I, how we could have to have a CEQA analysis for some internal city policy about city events and facilities, I, I can't imagine. But I hope the city attorney, when they come back with further analysis, will say, yeah, you're right. We don't need to do that. Um, okay, so a couple of other just very small points. Um, one is on... Uh, paper food products. And forgive me, I, my notes were not careful enough. I don't remember exactly who had mentioned uh, this during the report. Um, I think it may have been Ms. Pinkerton, but we were talking about the, the chemicals and other items within paper products that have to ensure, that we have to ensure that they are appropriately compostable. Um, the one suggestion I would make there is, um, I'm not a big believer in compostable or biodegradable because usually that's greenwashing that you know isn't real. Um, and paper, you know, product companies and plastic product companies sell their items as being biodegradable or something when in all practicality they're of course not. Um, so uh, and and compostable is fine if it's going in our green bin because we know that we compost but nobody else does, you know, compostable stuff that goes in the black bin never ever will break down in, in our landfills. So it's just one of these lies that companies say in, in a effort to greenwash their products. So rather than purchasing compostable items, I would really recommend that we look a lot harder at whether products are anaerobically digestible because as we move forward, especially with um, uh, you know, Recicla mandates that our haulers are already mandated to meet and aren't meeting with regard to our organic wastes, um, we're just going to have to be a lot more aggressive in ensuring that our restaurants in particular and other producers of organic waste are getting that waste digested. Um, and diverted from the landfill in that way. Um, and so if a, a soiled paper product, you know, a post-consumer paper plate or takeout container or whatever that's soiled with food, um, most of that's not gonna be compostable under any circumstances, but it will absolutely be anaerobically digestible um, as long as, you know, it meets the, the needs of that. So I. That's the focus that I would recommend that we look at more than compostability. Um, so I, I don't, if anybody has any thoughts about that, that's fine. It was just, but that would be my suggestion. Well, we're and lucky. Then, uh, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but Go we ahead. are really lucky. We have Dr. Rowena Romano, who did her PhD at UC Davis on anaerobic digestion. So if there's oh. anybody expert in the field, really it's Dr. Romano, and she built digesters on for a big plant in California, which is named Nameless, but they don't. Ah. So she's she's the top expert in the state, I would consider her. On Outstanding. Education. Well, this this may be a whole much longer, deeper conversation than about Recycla that we'll save for another moment when, when it's on the agenda, but um, glad, to, glad to hear that. Um, the other recommendation I, I would make um, in terms of outreach, uh, Ms. Pinkerton, you were talking about the difficulty of getting information from finance about, you know, minority businesses to do outreach to. And so, and I get it because finance has all kinds of restrictions on, you know, 
anonymity and, and so forth. And, and it's, it's always hard getting that. But I, I would recommend if you haven't already done so, uh, to go to the chambers, um, go to particularly the minority chambers, and, and they have just go around our system by going directly to the chambers and they'll do the necessary outreach to minority businesses. And then, you know, our certified DBEs too. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we have, if it doesn't exactly fit within the, you know, definition of minority businesses, because it's, you know, a DBE, that's fine. I think we're, we're meeting the need for doing outreach to achieve equitable application by doing those things. So if you haven't already done that, those would be my suggestions. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I've, I've gone on long. So I think that's that's it for now. No, it's all right, Mr. Krikorian and I made notes of these two recommendations. They'll, we'll be sure and incorporate them. The anaerobic digestion related to composting and organic waste. And we'll get some feedback on that. And then the minority chamber outreach uh, for sure. Uh, and I wanna echo what you said in terms of uh, really complimenting uh, Ellie San for this incredible work and uh, all the expert uh, feedback we've received today. And that just shows how dedicated you are uh, to this, this initiative. And, and we appreciate that very much. And I, I was just reflecting really briefly, I'll just say that I think in the city of Los Angeles, we are so accustomed to getting lawsuits against us for you name it, that it has a way of making us, I think, um, conflict averse. And we put up these barriers and we start getting in our own way. And it becomes this upside down world of, like you mentioned, why seek what exists is to really uplift exactly what we are trying to accomplish. So we just simply have to trudge forward and, and, and I like the way Mr. Kobian uh, um, suggested that we, we phase in and analyze as we work through our CEQA or our categorical exemptions to you know, give us um, the strong argument and documentation for when we do get those lawsuits. But it cannot, that fear cannot uh, make us stop or halt our forward progression on this. Um, that would just be a, a terrible mistake. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and be bold. Uh, and in fact, we need to do that all the time, really, but also uh, build the record that offers the argument against those uh, types of legal actions that will invariably be taken. We have to just be able to tell and have the winning narrative uh, that will hold up. So anyway, uh, that's an observation I have based on this conversation. So, so colleagues, what I'd like to do is approve this item with the following amendments. A, for recommendations five and six, I'd like to amend to add that the draft ordinances will need to come back along with the required CEQA analysis. Two, receive and file instruction seven, since this has been introduced already. Three, instruct GSD Recreation of Parks and relevant departments to implement all aspects of attachment two. And that's Council Files 21 0064, dated March 30th, 2022. Uh, just the one file uh, of the BOS report uh, Zero Waste Mandates for City Sponsored, Hosted Community, and Catered Events that do not require adoption of an ordinance by January 1st of 2023. Number four. Adopt the instructions identified in attachment four of Bureau of Sanitation Report, Council File 21 0064, dated March 30th of 2022, pertaining to the Office of the City Attorney and the Department of General Services upon completion of necessary CEQA analysis based on the City Attorney assessment as to form and legality. Five, develop the following reporting requirements of zero waste plans and implementation. Bullet point one, all departments to complete a zero waste plan by September 30th of 2022, all departments. Bullet point two, all general managers to appoint departmental zero waste coordinators by September 30th of 2022. Six, 
instruct Bureau of Sanitation to assist departments with compliance by providing updated recycling and diversion rate data by July 31st of 2023 and every year thereafter. Um, bullet point one on, under number six, all departments must submit an annual status report with waste tonnage data by September 30th of 22 and every year thereafter. Bullet point two, all departments must respond to requests for information from Bureau of Sanitation to facilitate the annual AB 939 mandatory reporting and annual local environmentally preferable purchasing reporting. And seven, instruct Bureau of Sanitation to report to this committee annually on all departments' progress toward implementing zero waste plans. And I will reiterate Mr. Krikorian's points, and that is report back on the anaerobic digestion um, capabilities related to composting and our organic waste uh, program. And then uh, report back on outreach specific to uh, our minority chambers as it relates to uh, the elimination of plastic waste and zero waste. And um, I think that covers it. And with, with that, Mr. Villanueva, could you please call the roll? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz. Council Member Joe Cedillo. Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved as amended, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to item five. Uh, please uh, read the item. Sure. Item number five is a Bureau of Sanitation report relative to illegal dumping and the need for education, eradication, and enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Sutton Willis. Uh, and um, thank you, Mr. DeLeon, for the motions you've introduced that resulted in this report before us now. I understand that we, uh, we still have, of course, LA Sanitation present. So uh, I'll hand it over to you, Ms. Romero, to go over the report. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting this important issue. Um, illegal dumping is an issue that touches everyone that is in LA. Um, I think uh, to uh, take Mr. Uh, Council Mark Krikorian's word, we all have experienced sometimes it's frustration, sometimes it's, you know, um, uh, dumbfounded, uh, but surprisingly other times we do get thank yous. I got one, you know, yesterday on our response time. Um, but, you know, today our report is going to highlight what we've been doing, um, but more importantly is what are our lessons learned and to take another word that you guys talked in the other in the other report, urgency. How are we going to do better, not just with asking for more resources, because we do need more resources, but looking at our efficiencies and our inefficiencies and also our coordination. Um, all of you told me when I met with you is all of you thought this is an issue that every single one of you has taken you know, a role in it because it, you, you felt like you had to do it yourselves. And so what we need to do and what we're talking here is how do we better coordinate those efforts? How do we better um, address the issues even within other departments? And then more importantly, I wanna say thank you to the staff because we have eight divisions that touch illegal dumping. So some of the frustrations is that. But that doesn't mean that we're not, they're not, we're not doing addressing it. It's just not addressing it in the ways up, you know, what how we've been doing it, you know, with the need today and the urgency is we gotta re-look at it and look at it hard. So I wanna thank the staff because I think, you know, I had them have a hard look at it and say, you know what, we need to, we need to do better and we need to improve where we need to. And it's it's just the way it had been designed. But where are those uh those opportunities. And today we're gonna, Gabe is gonna touch on, you know, and focus on, I think the, the high priority issue is the eradication piece. You know, we need the three E's, but I think today, if we work on this first, the other two have a role, but I think I wanted to make sure you understand how complex it is and where we think we need to go moving forward. And, and I, you know, the, the coordination with you guys is gonna be this triage, has to happen today. And I just uh, urge you for your support and for your thoughts and insights, because I think we we have no other option than, than to look at and 
and move forward together um, because I, I feel like we've done um, a lot, but we, we still need to do a lot more in educating um, people in partnership with your offices is has to be, you know, elevated, um, but the operations of it have to be reexamined. And here, hopefully in the report, you saw some things and we want to hear what else you think we need to be thinking about and doing moving forward. Gabe. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Gabe Miranda, Division Manager, Livability Services Division with Alley Sanitation and Environment. So we put together a brief PowerPoint, which summarizes the key points and recommendations of the report back. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it. On February 1st, the City Council introduced the following motions in response to the ever-growing need to educate, eradicate, and enforce against illegal dumping. So Alley San has created specific programs and policies to address illegal dumping, unwanted household items, abandoned waste, hazardous materials, and bio waste. While these complex and intricate programs and policies are designed to build and overlap into a connected system of service, Alley San does recognize that the programs must be further enhanced to reach even more residential and commercial customers and maximize the services at most potential. Illegal dumping is both a public hazard and blight in our public right of way. And in this report, we discussed the various components as our director and general man manager mentioned, from illegal dumping servicing to the recycler component, our multifamily bulky item program, our clean stat indexing system, as well as our care program. So to address illegal dumping, a holistic and comprehensive plan must be executed to further strengthen the services to abate illegal dumping, starting with education, leveraging of educational tools to ensure that businesses and residents are informed of the proper way to dispose of trash and debris. Next is coordination, to ensure that we're coordinating with our nonprofits that are performing light litter and weed abatement and ensuring that we're not overlapping these services, but rather complementing. And enforcement, coordination across departments, public education, assigning additional resources, including staffing, and establishment of enforcement fines and penalties. And as our director mentioned, eradication, the single most important thing, ensuring that we reduce our response time and remove illegal dumping from our streets in an expedited manner. And lastly, expansion. With the expansion of the Livability Services Division and the CARE program as a whole, ensuring that we have enough facility space uh, to house the additional personnel that were recently approved through the budget process. Starting with education is a critical component in keeping the city clean. Currently, LA Sands programs primarily lead their own grassroots outreach efforts, supplemented by LA Sands small internal marketing and community services group. On the citywide approach, leveraging social media and the reporting of illegal dumping materials through MyLA, as well as utilizing social media to reach more people. LA Sands Community Service Group regularly attends events citywide to spread the message on proper disposal of trash and recycling opportunities. The Public Affairs Office is involved with media outreach and the development of collateral materials. And looking at the commercial sector with our Kugu Cleanup Greenup, which promotes pollution prevention, as well as Recycla inspection teams as ambassadors educate and assist commercial and multifamily homeowners via canvassing the outreach on topics. So education is a critical component to addressing illegal dumping, and LA San is recommending one service coordinator to assist with launching these educational efforts in a more centralized and coordinated manner. I mentioned coordination. We have been working closely with the Board of Public Works and the Office of Community Beautification on the Clean LA program. LA San has worked to develop and streamline a more comprehensive and efficient model of deployment and support for cleaning and maintaining the city's public right of ways. As I mentioned, it's ensure that we can track some of the data from nonprofits and folks doing light litter abatement to ensure that these services are complementing each other and not overlapping, and ensuring that we have metrics to really gauge the effectiveness of these efforts. As well as council district efforts, we're aware that discretionary funds can oftentimes be used uh, to really support these efforts and, and have these cleanup activities taking place. And we want to make sure that we're coordinating with each of the council districts. So we are recommending a superintendent and administrative staff and a GIS specialist to build upon the platform of the Clean LA program with each of the 15 council districts and make sure that we're managing and, and, and really having accountability as it relates to the cleanup activities taking place citywide. 
So within the Livability Services Division, this division is responsible to responding to and servicing illegal dumping citywide. Our seller resources collections divisions are responsible for servicing household bulky items such as mattresses, couches, e-waste, large items in single family and multifamily residences. In 2021, the Livability Services Division responded to almost 30,000 service requests for illegal dumping and removing over 15,000 tons. Looking at the data as a reactionary component through MyLA, we also have our clean stat program, which really gives us that proactive look of items throughout the city that are unreported. It's a street by street assessment, which collects data used to determine the cleanliness of the city streets. The program assesses the city twice a year, identifying unreported household items, such as bulky items, e-waste, illegal dumping, litter, weeds, and the data is then compiled through a grading formula, which basically grades it in a simple one, two, three category. Due to the amount of unreported illegal dumping, LASN has developed a proactive approach to addressing locations with chronic dumping. Using historical service requests, as well as clean stat data, service teams composed of dedicated staff are deployed to ensure that an adequate level of service is offered citywide. LSD is recommending additional staffing, however, to ensure that we have seven day a week coverage. In addition to that, looking at the team structure, we wanna establish to ensure that collection and investigation of illegal dumping takes place simultaneously. So we are requesting additional environmental compliance inspectors to be assigned with the teams to ensure that there's no pause or delay in collection and investigation, which takes place simultaneously. The multifamily bulky item program, which was established in 2007 to collect bulky items in and around multifamily areas. LASAM proposes to bring MFBI staffing levels back to their original allocated authorities and ensure that we include a proposal for 25 additional RCTOs and vehicles. Crews will be reassigned to areas of greatest need. These areas will be chosen by the data I mentioned through our clean stat and my LA data. And they will be able to work in canvas in areas where Items may be placed out, but not reported. Areas of high density apartments could receive multiple days of service to address the volume and frequency of material generated and discarded. The removal of material would be proactive and planned, creating a regular and manageable maintenance, ensuring that we're hitting things on the reactionary and proactive side. Programmatic enhancements. This does not require more resources, but us looking at the systems that we're using and how service requests are being routed. LASAN is ex exploring options to look at the system and have the system work better for us. When you look at the flow chart there, it gives the progression of a service request. Once a service request is generated on average today, it takes approximately four days for that to be field verified as illegal dumping. Illegal dumping managed by livability services takes approximately 48 hours once received. So from inception of the service request, the response time is six days. And we're looking at ways to improve the system to better route the service request for more expedited servicing. Enforcement. LASAM will continue to focus on education of the public, as we mentioned, to our customers, focusing on staffing and resources for eradication, but enforcement and ensure that we reconvene the interdepartmental working group to review existing city-based municipal codes, determine their efficacy, suggest possible changes and enhancements, and review their compliance with state and federal codes. When you see the chart there, LASAN continues to want to work with this group, which includes the Bureau of Street Lighting, Building and Safety, Department of Water and Power, and of course, the City Attorney's Office. And lastly, expansion. Since 2019, the division has expanded. When the CARE program was launched, there was 274 authorities in the Livability Services Division, and today there are 416 authorities. As it stands, LSD expansion without new facilities to house staff and equipment would result in a critical overflow. So as such, LSD is prepared to develop any available sites that can accommodate the division's needs. LASAN is utilizing regional deployment for the division. Uh, what you see here on this chart are the five current operational sites that Livability Services Division operates out of. Um, in the middle there, we have facilities in development. Lopez Canyon has been in development since 2019, and it's actually close to being completed. However, the LADOT lot, which recently was approved, is not slated to be operational until sometime next year. 
The three sites you see on the right are proposed facilities. Arlington, Slauson, and Mariana have all been in discussions, both with the CAO and mayor's office. And the recommendations in our report for the 61 positions supporting these various entities of education, eradication, collaboration, and enforcement. And Ali San feels that the education, eradication, and enforcement plan will make a notable difference in the city, improving quality of life, collecting EUW material faster, immediately investigating those responsible at the point of collection, additional staffing and trucks to eradicate unreported household bulky items on a proactive basis will further reduce blight and improve livability by staffing up the multifamily bulky item program. And of course, coordination and collaboration to ensure that we're developing the necessary tools to reinforce the programs and policies that have been instituted. And with that, we will make ourselves available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe, for a comprehensive report, uh, chock full of information, really appreciate it. And um, I, I wanna commend Mr. DeLeon as well, and, and happy to uh, sign on to almost all, if not all of his motions on this. Um, Angelinos want a cleaner Los Angeles. There is just no question about it. I think it's a universal desire. Uh, and um, so I, I uh, am very hopeful and optimistic that we can uh, really satisfy that justified desire. Uh, and so my, I really have one question and then, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. De Leon. And that is these requests for positions and resources Will, will this be included in the mayor's budget proposal or are these gonna be recommendations intended to be supplemental to the budget request? They will be supplemental to the budget request. Yeah, we didn't right. them. Thank you for that. I mean, I've, I for one had a conversation with the mayor a couple of months ago and, and I, I urged him uh, to put a, a clean LA agenda forward uh, in, in his final budget proposal. So I'm, I'm I continue to have crossed. Yeah, <laughs> and I see you're crossing yours too. Yes. I'm hopeful. And with that, I'd like to turn over to Mr. DeLeon to start. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciate the conversation and, and, and the leadership. Let me start off by saying, you know, just a very special thank you to the LA SAN team for the, the great presentation. It, it's clear that a, a tremendous amount of thought and effort has gone to streamlining how we how we actually address uh, illegal dumping in the city and developing a, a blueprint for how we can improve our our response times and ensure obviously that the legal dumping is addressed equitably you know when I underscore equitably across the city uh, i want to thank you mr chair you know for seconding the, the four motions that, that call back for report back uh, because uh, legal dumping as the report shows clearly is literally in every corner of the city and i was really blown away to to see how bad certain areas of the city are you know especially portions of of south la and the east valley and in, in, in central la i'm gonna not you know i, I was gonna ask a couple questions but the, given that i'm having uh, some ipad uh challenges and the because the juice I have to is, is going down. I want to make sure I'm able to make my amendments and, and vote on this because I think there's only three of us. We can't lose a quorum right now on this issue. But, you know, Mr. Mr. Chair, with, uh, uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to make a couple recommendations um, as amendments. One is request the Office of the City Attorney with assistance from uh, the Board of Sanitation to recommend language for inclusion in all city contracts for cleanup related services for the public right of way to coordinate with uh, LA SANS uh, to receive full digital access to the clean LA GIS based uh, ESRI web map system to confirm completion of service requests and avoid duplicative efforts uh, between the uh, Board of Sanitation and city contractors. And, and last, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make the following recommendation as well, which is to instruct the Department of General Services with assistance from the uh, Board of Sanitation and CAO to report to municipal facilities, uh, to report to municipal facilities committee, uh, AMC, AMFC, I should say, within 30 days 
with a list of properties for lease or purchase for the city, uh, for the city to acquire, to house the uh, Board of Sands uh, crews as well as equipment. I know that was a that was a lot. You know, I'm not sure if you got it all. Of my staff, you know, um, have given you the, the the verbatim, you know, via a document form or email to your staff, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Mr. Krikorian, anything to add to this? There always is, Mr. Chair, but in the interest of time, uh, I, I will reserve my comments, I suppose, for when all this comes to budget, because all of this is going to re require significant investment. So I do have a lot of thoughts, but it, it can wait. So I'm happy to proceed forward. Mr. Gregorian, our, our budget hawk as chair of the budget committee. We can't hear you, council member. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. I, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I wanna thank LA Sanitation uh, for, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces ready to answer all these questions. So thank you so much for that, for being there and for this uh, great presentation, Gabe. Um, I understand that Personnel, Audits and Animal Welfare Committee had a hearing on a similar subject yesterday as well. So I'd like to move to approve the report, today's report with the following amendments. Um, and I just wanna reiterate and ensure that uh, Bureau of Sanitation has built in efficiencies in regard to the removal of illegally dumped materials. So there's no duplication of efforts as it relates to three, the 311 app requests, uh, various neighborhood cleanups, most often coordinated with the individual city council offices, but sometimes neighborhood groups as well. So there's there's a lot of good volunteers and it goes on and I wanna make sure that this doesn't interfere with our efficiencies to uh, service all of the city's needs. So um, uh, let's start with Mr. Dillon's amendments are in regard to instructions five and six in the report. So Mr. DeLeon's amendments are specific to instructions five and six contained in the report. So that is part of the instructions here. And then furthermore, instruct Bureau of Sanitation with assistance from the CAO and the CLA to review, analyze, and provide additional and thorough fiscal impact context on the recommendations numbered one, two, four, and seven within the report dated March 31st uh, last month, 22. Council file 22-0376 uh, noted below, uh, which I'll note below. Uh, on an expedi expedited basis to mitigate extensive illegal dumping and to reconcile existing efforts and to be prepared to consider the matter within the pending 22-23 budget deliberation hearings uh, as also I will reference below. Uh, two, uh, receive and file recommendations numbered three and eight, since they were already approved uh, in the PAW committee. Um, so I believe that covers it. Again, thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krikorian. A lot to figure out here as we, um, as we really, I think, respond to the needs and the requests of this constituents across the city to, to have a cleaner Los Angeles. So, um, our Bureau of Sanitation is what makes all of that possible. So we thank you for your incredible work. Uh, and with that, any other questions or comments? Mr. DeLeon or Mr. Krikorian? All right, I'd like to move. Uh, yes, go ahead. No, I'm, I apologize, Mr. I'm good to go. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to move to approve this item as amended if there are no objections. Uh, and Mr. Villanueva, if you could please read, uh, please call the roll. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Koretz. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved as amended, Mr. Chair. Terrific. Thank you so much. This was another very dense uh, committee hearing, but that's the work that's required to move us forward. So I want to thank everyone for their patience and their incredible work again. Uh, and with that, um, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much.